and welcome to Data Diversity Talks, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers around data. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we have a special podcast for you today, which was recorded live from Enterprise Data World Digital as we discuss building a career in data management with a panel of data management experts. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is a special edition of My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. And what makes today special is we are recording live for Enterprise Data World Digital, affectionately known as EDW, the longest running event produced by Dataversity in partnership with DEMA International. And while today is a digital event, I'm so happy to announce that EDW will be returning in person this year, September 18th through 21st in Anaheim, California. And today we are joined by a panel of data management professionals to discuss building a career in data management. And I'm gonna ask the panelists to introduce themselves. So if y'all can turn your cameras on. Well, if you would tell us your name, your job title and what you currently do. April, let's start with you. Hello and welcome. Hi there, I'm April Reeve. So I'm in transition um, I'm, I've been, I, my career has been in uh, pharmaceuticals and financial services, corporate, I've mostly worked for corporations, and I'm moving towards just doing uh, teaching and writing um, and, and uh, away from working for corporations for, for I guess, probably forever. And um, <laughs> so that's it for me for now. Historically, you've hold, held a role as a data architect. Is that correct? Um, I've alternated between being a data architect and a project manager, program manager. So, from you know between between creating a vision and implementing uh, the the vision. I love it. Thank you, David. Good morning. My name is David Plotkin. I am the head of metadata services at um, a large uh, bank. Um, a lot of my career has been in either banking or insurance, because that seems to be the, the types of companies that, uh, that had openings when I needed them. Um, but it's been very, very satisfying. Um, my background is uh, as an engineer, uh, transitioning to data management in the late 80s, uh, and sort of progressing through uh, various um, uh, practical things like data administration, data modeling, metadata, data quality, and finally data governance and data stewardship. Um, the future looks like, uh, much like April, um, uh, planning to step away from the, the nine to five uh, employee of a large corporation and try and and using my skills to perhaps help organizations that you know can't afford um, you know large expensive uh, consultancies uh, to try and give back in that realm because there are certainly companies and school districts and counties and the like Habitat for Humanity uh, who need our skills but can't really afford to pay a lot of money for them so that's it for me. I love that. That's so great about this community is everyone's so willing to help each other out and give back. Uh, it's just one of the best parts of being part of this community. Darren, hello and welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Darren Hook. I'm the Director of Data Governance and Management at American Express. And I have been for the last year. Uh, I've been in data governance uh, for 
uh, 10 plus years. Uh, so I've, I've been the director of data governance for uh, three companies now, uh, all in the financial services industry. Nice. And Frank, hello and welcome. Hi, welcome. I'm Frank Serwin. Uh, I basically am doing what David is planning to do. I've been doing that for the last six years. I basically became an independent consultant, uh, working with a number of different industries, mostly global. And uh, fortunately, I haven't had to market because of the network. I've built over 46 years in IT. So my career began in the 70s. I started with government entity um, and went into consulting for a little while, then went into mostly financial services. But I've worked with pharmacies and restaurants. I, I was a director at McDonald's of uh, Global Data Services, also a director at J.P. Morgan Chase. Very nice. So tell me, um, how did y'all get into this space and why have you stayed? Uh, David, let's start with you. Okay. Well, I think as, as so many will probably answer, it was purely by accident. Um, I was working as a, I have a degree in chemical engineering, working at Chevron and um, Chevron does everything with engineers. So they were recruiting people who knew something about computers um, and recruited me into a new organization that was gathering requirements and doing data modeling. That led the natural progression to um, metadata to data quality, and then data governance and data stewardship, which is kind of where my career has been for about the last 15 years. Very nice. Uh, and let's move to Darren. Yeah, so uh, I moved into the data governance space uh, I when I was actually a business analyst at Hewlett Packard. And I was going to get my MBA at uh, Purdue, and uh, long story short, I was looking for uh, another job, another role. So I was searching for business analyst, data analyst, uh, and and one popped up that said data governance business analyst. And like what David said, I I stumbled into it because I didn't know what it meant. I I just thought, hey, this might get me closer to the data, and so I. I applied and I don't even know if the, the company even understood what data governance was. Uh, they, they just, you know, brought me on and, and I started learning what it was and found out that, you know, rather than me, I, I thought, oh, maybe I, I want to be a data scientist. I, I got my MBA at Purdue with a concentration in data and analytics, thinking, you know, probably data science. And as I learned more and grew in my role in data governance, I realized I'd be able to work with people more. I liked bridging the gap between technology and, and business and uh, being able to translate for the other. Uh, really found that, that I enjoyed with all the chaos that uh, data brings that I could then step in and bring that clarity and, and communicate to the right people uh, what the value of data is and, and that I could take that passion that, that I have for data uh, and people and, and bring those together in, in a career. So I've uh, really enjoyed staying in the space. I love it, thanks. Frank. Well, I actually, uh, data management, I have to say is a self-made position. Um, I happen to be an application development and support manager at a major Chicago bank. And I was responsible for ATM systems, teller systems, um, interactive voice response, internet banking, and uh, I started to see a lot of similarities in the data and came up with this idea for an omni-channel customer master data solution and uh, designed it at my kitchen table at home and <laughs> presented it to management. They liked the idea and said, great, go and build a team and start and do it and, and deploy it. Um, and actually this was in 1989, years before any master data solutions were uh, commercial master data solutions were on the market and if anybody's wondering yes the bank did file a patent on it and i got to work on the patent as well so that's very cool april so how'd so, you get this space yeah yeah so i was i was a programmer i was working for um a software company in the financial services area and uh, and i was programming i was managing building product and um and they came to me and they said, 
Um, we need somebody to run our, our data migration, data conversion group. And I started doing that and I, and, you know, and I created that capability and like Frank was saying, you know, you create a new capability and I was just, I was really good at it. So <laughs> I, I, I started building on that and then looking around for other people that were also working in this data space. Very cool. So, so all of you kind of fell into this, you know, so what made you good at it and what did you bring to these roles to make yourselves valuable? Um, Darren, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I've been told that I just have the personality for <laughs> for data governance, I guess. Um, and and how I translate that is that I uh, think that I'm I'm pretty good with uh, establishing relationships with people and gaining that trust, because because data governance is so new uh, and and a lot of people don't know about it. You kind of need that person who is willing to share knowledge, willing to train others, willing to and, and, and able to communicate uh, what's going on, what the vision is, you know, how, how this strategy is going to translate into value. And I, I think that, yeah, just having, again, that, that passion for, uh, you know, and, and understanding of the knowledge of, of data and, and the importance of it uh, really, you know, helped me to gain that trust of people that we're going on this new journey and, and you can trust in me and, and we can, you know, go through this journey together. And, uh, and then once you start getting more value from it, uh, then you're able to, to then, you know, show more and more people and get more people on board and uh, just continue to run with it. Very nice. Frank. Well, I, I think it's my, basically I've developed a holistic perspective of master data management. And, and I owe that to a lot of the different roles that I've had over the course of my career. I mean, I was, I was an application developer. I worked, I managed database administrators as many as, many as 85 DBAs at one time. <laughs> um, data integration, I, I, for the bank, I also uh, was disaster recovery coordinator. Uh, I was a manager of their e-commerce site. So across all those different experiences I've had, I just think it basically gave me a very a holistic perspective, basically, of, of master data management, as well as data governance. And so that's what I decided basically to focus on my, on my career at the, towards the tail end of my career, as I call it now. Very nice. And April. So one of my earliest bosses said I could make something out of nothing. That I was I was really good at creating a vision of what we what we needed and then and then implementing that. And um and and I think that that was that was one of the aspects that made me a really good enterprise data architect, right? That that I could look at the whole picture and say, "Oh, we need this piece and and it needs to look like this and it needs to interface in this way. Um, the the other side of that coin is um, in terms of of operationalizing data management, you, it really requires a, an ability to focus at a detail level on the on the data, right? And so, you know, people in data management, some may be good at the big picture and people who are actually working day to day with the data, they have to be really good at that detail focus level. And, um, uh, and I can and do both. I, I think that people in data management t actually tend to be a bit ambidextrous, like seriously, right? Um, because they have the, this right brain, left brain balance capability. Everyone was nodding, yes. <laughs> Very so, nice. yeah. so it's it's not you know I mean it's not not everybody really has that that balance that ability to cross and musicians do which is which is why a, like a lot of people in data management also happen to be musicians. Very true. I I like that correlation. Uh, David. 
Yeah, so a lot of what the other folks have said uh, applies to me as well. Um, I'm good at building relationships. Uh, I always considered myself a bridge guy, bridging between IT and the business, um, which is ideal for data governance uh, because it is a business initiative, but it has to be supported by IT. And in a lot of companies, the initial impetus to try and get data governance going is an IT initiative, but it is not going to work very well unless the business buys in. So there's very much of a role there. Um, building trust, as Darren said, and being able to communicate uh, in my early days. Oh, and also as an engineer, having a mind for details as well as being an analytical thinker. And I have this specific focus on uh, practical, uh, practical uh, steps to get the work done. So somebody else, you know, a Ron Ross or somebody like that might come up with a you know, high powered um, set of principles say around business rules. And then for me, it was always like now in the real world, how can I take that really good idea and turn it into something we can implement step by step by step. And that has been the cornerstone of, of, of my career is to do all of that and be good at it and be trusted and be the person that people come to whenever they can't figure something out and say, can you help me understand this? So that was pretty much it. Very nice. So um, first, how do you get through now the tough parts of data management, right? How, how do you get through temporary crises or a layoff? Should you reinvent yourself, find a new role? How do you handle the tough parts? So, uh, Frank, let's start with you. And actually, before I'll answer that question, there was that correlation to music, which actually I heard that back in the 80s. Yeah. And one time I brought my staff into a room, there was 15 of us, and I asked my staff, I said, so how many of you had a background in music, which includes me, by the way, and 14 people raised their hand. And Do the one just, person who yeah. didn't said, Funny thing is, I've never played an instrument, but the but the English translation of my name is is music. So, so that counts. You know? <laughs> That's funny. But, Should we test that theory now? How many right. of us here are have some involvement in music? Yeah, oh, so, <laughs> but the majority, right? <laughs> I thought so, you were going to say, let's test it out by like singing or harmonizing or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't do that. I won't do that so I'll, I'll answer that question first. The question you asked. Um, I'd, I'd say, you know, people have to, and it just, I told this to staff that worked in, you know, for me as well as I was mentoring IT people in transition for several years after I was in transition, the, the networking groups I was part of would send uh, IT professionals to me to, to mentor for years. Um, I'd say one of the things is you have to take control of your own career. I mean, don't expect your company to run your career for you. Um, and I've and I've run across people who think that who think that, like, well, if they don't pay for the class, I, I'm not going to take it, or if they don't pay for a particular book and don't reimburse me, I'm not going to buy it. And I say, you know, you really have to take charge of your own career, and you know, you're responsible for it, not your company. And if your company happens to help out by providing, you know, classes or whatever, great. But uh, but I know, you know, that that's kind of thing I've, I've been all through my career where I basically went on my own, learned a lot of things on my own through reading, through joining DEMA. I've been a member of DEMA Chicago for, gosh, I don't know, 30 years or more. Um, you know, going to these conferences, you know, learning things and, and basically, you know, even paying for memberships in, in uh, you know, organizations. Uh, but I'd say that's that's the one thing I'd really kind of stress is is that you know and and unfortunately I, I see a lot of people who basically look to their company to say you know to run their career for them. Very nice, uh, David. Yeah. So repeat the question again because I think we might we might. Uh, I just want to yeah. make sure I stay on topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So how how are we handling the tough times? You know through get through a temporary crisis or layoff and should you reinvent yourself, find a new role? All right, thank, thank yeah. you very much, Shannon. So 
here's where that sort of, I talked earlier about being a practitioner and solving problems step by step by step. So there, there are certain things, I mean, probably the most important one, and I know it's obvious, is be prepared. Be prepared to make the jump um, if you need to make the jump. Be, pre you know, always the usual stuff, keep your resume up to date and whatnot. Um, but over the years, what I've gotten really good at is sort of keeping tabs, for example, on recruiters who are looking for um, roles that are good, that, that there is a good fit. Might not be interested at the time, but I keep a record. And of course, we're LinkedIn now, right? And, and so being able to reach out to them um, and say, well, I wasn't interested before, but what do you got now? Um, there are also, I've learned uh, in these many years, certain warning signs that something is coming. And, you know, one of the things Tony mentioned was, you know, you always seem to be able to get a new job quickly. Well, I have a very strong network. In fact, one of the jobs I got, I was recruited into it by April because she's part of my network, right? And I'm part of hers. Um, but uh, you need to be, you know, ready to make, to, to do that. Um, and of course, um, those warning signs can be, uh, very subtle, uh, but if you see things happening at your company that's making your job, for example, more and more difficult, maybe you're not allowed to travel anymore. And you know how do how can you be the head of data stewardship if you can't meet with folks? You know, and this was in the days before Zoom and 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 that kind of thing. But even now, um, you know, I'm I'm definitely a believer in face-to-face uh, -face being needed once in a while, at least once in a while. When that becomes impossible, what that tells me is the company is not putting the value on what I do that I'm putting on it. And then it's time to maybe start responding positively to those recruiters and seeing what else is out there. Perfect. April. I think that Frank mentioned networking. David mentioned networking. I think that in terms of you know finding new jobs, networking is critical. And networking doesn't happen when you lose a job. It's it it needs to be going on and happening all the time. Um, I'm terrible, by the way, at it. Like when I've had layoff situations, like I just want to get in bed and pull the covers up, and I don't want to talk to anybody. Um, but it, but that's the thing you you need to do. You need to be talking every day. You need to be contacting your network and stuff. And by the way, LinkedIn now absolutely is kind of the best place in terms of you know networking and finding jobs and connecting. Um, the last three jobs I've had have been through LinkedIn. Either I've found a job and gone out and applied, or in two of the cases, they found me through LinkedIn. So, um, so you know, that, um, and maybe LinkedIn is getting to be even a little old fashioned in terms of uh, job search <laughs> these days, but, um, but that's been what's worked for me. Um, and, um, and I've also, I've also found um, these are great, you know, and I think to Frank's point, you know, your training and keeping up and moving forward with, with skills, developing skills should be an ongoing thing. Um, but I've also found that, you know, periods between jobs are an excellent time uh, to train and, and reskill and um, as well. Yeah, by the way, April, yeah. my, one of my jobs, I also was found through LinkedIn, so. I'll vote yeah. for that. <laughs> and, and what and what I would add to that is that LinkedIn seems to do the best job of any of the uh, boards or recruiters at making a good match on your skills. I get some really wild out in left field uh, queries from recruiters. I don't from LinkedIn. They're they're usually spot on. But be careful what you put out on other social media because the HR departments will check. <laughs> Just a word of warning about social media. <laughs> <Yeah>. advice. <laughs> Darren. 
Yeah, I uh, completely agree with what everyone has already said. Just to touch on a few of those, uh, I think David was saying that, you know, you got to be prepared for that time. And I completely agree with not only your network, uh, you know, as, as much as your skills uh, as possible, uh, but also those touching on the warning signs uh, that he was talking about. Uh, so I've, I've seen those uh, throughout my career as well. And uh, being in data governance, you have to, you know, obviously, uh, data governance is different for each organization, depending on the culture. And there are some cultures that inhibit <laughs> uh, accelerating uh, data governance initiatives because we're all about collaboration and bringing people together. If the organization's culture is going in a different way and and more siloed and uh, you know not uh, that that environment where people can collaborate. Uh, that's when I've started, yeah, looking for uh, other positions. Um, and so I, I actually had a friend uh, call me yesterday, uh, you know, who uh, has has been an analyst, uh, you know, in a few different roles, has his MBA, and wanted to learn more about data roles. And I was like, this is a great space to be in. It, it is a blue ocean of opportunity. Uh, there's such high demand and it's going to continue. And so being in this space, even if you don't have the experience, people will, will take you even if you show a little bit of initiative. Uh, if you go out to one of the tooling sites uh, and you know, download you know, their, their tool and play around with it in a sandbox, or, or there's a lot of opportunities out there to uh, get certifications that are for free. Uh, or uh, are you know don't cost uh, too much, and you can put that on your resume to say, hey, I am now shifting and reinventing myself, and and want to get into the data governance, data management, you know, et cetera space. Uh, I I feel like you know traditional academic uh, methods, you know, are are great, uh, but then there's also uh, so many more opportunities to learn and continually learn and add those skills and, and certifications and uh, things on, on your resume. Very nice and very uh, appropriate uh, advice. You know, I will say that in terms of networking and LinkedIn, one of the best advice, um, some of the best advice that I've heard is actually Darren from your employee, Ocrity, who's on your team. She's amazing. She actually goes yeah. out and looks for mentors on LinkedIn and just contacts people and just establishes relationships and says, hey, are you going to, you know, up for some coffee, you know, virtual coffee. And it's just a great way to, to build that network. So I said the same thing uh, to my friend yesterday and, and said, you're not going to get responses from everybody. But you know what? If, if you do it enough, then there's going to be some in, in that pipeline that do actually respond and, and take some time to mentor you and, and talk you through, uh, you know, what you can do next to, uh, you know, uh, better your career. Ready to share your knowledge and network with your data peers? Join us in San Diego this June for the Data Governance and Information Quality Conference. Five days packed full of new perspectives, new colleagues, and new approaches are yours when you register at dgiq2023west.dataversity.net. Lock in early bird savings when you register by May 5th. We'll see you there. And, uh, you know, um, on that note, you know, how do you stay uh, relevant? How do you grow into more senior roles? And are there conscious things you can do to position yourself for advancement in the field of data management? Um, let's start with April. Hey, yeah, so so this is, yeah, we're building, right? Um, networking, training, conferences, webinars, right? Um, what are other people doing uh, bringing these ideas into your organization or 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 you know bringing ideas into into those organizations um you know those those are the those are the basics those are important um and the thing that i think um is something that you can do in within your own organization is learning more about the tools that exist in your in your organization a lot of times there's a lot of tools that have already been purchased or already there and there and nobody knows really how to use them nobody really understands 
what the opportunities are without customization, right? They get in their, into their head, oh, we have to customize these tools. And it's like, hey, you know, those tools do some really in, uh, great things. Otherwise, they sort of wouldn't be on the market. You know, they wouldn't be doing well. Why don't you understand the way they do them and how we might, you might be able to use that. And, um, and I think that really shows within your own organization without changing, that can really show value um, to, the, to the organization. If you're using things that the organization already is paid for, already has, and leveraging that and making, making yourself more valuable to the organization in that way. That's great advice. Frank. I would say, I mean, one of the things that, that I found to be successful is don't get too hung up on the technologies. I mean, we need we really need to relate better to the business as, as IT professionals, because that's our job, right? I mean, that's that's what we're trying to do is, is to improve the business, you know, not to put out the latest and greatest technology necessarily. So, uh, you know, so it's, that's what I tell people. You really need to, you know, say, okay, how did you make that the business succeed? better? How did you make it better? And as a matter of fact, that's what, you know, you ought to be putting on resumes, right? I mean, not a laundry list of here's all the technologies I worked on because then it sounds just like everybody else's resume, right? Um, you know, and, and by the way, a resume, you know, is not an autobiography. It's it's a marketing tool to get you to be seen in person for that interview, right? A lot of people forget that, you know, and it sounds more like an autobiography. Uh, as a hiring manager, I've seen them over the years. I've even had to shame some uh, recruiters who basically sent me resumes that were 10 pages long, you know, like, I don't need to meet this person. I got, I know the whole, I got the whole book, you know, um, you know, but uh, I'd say that's, that's an important thing. Also, don't become too indispensable in your position. So indispensable that you can't move up, right? Train, start to train the people that can take your place because your management, you know, if they come to rely on you too heavily, they're not going to want to move here, right? So they're going to want to keep you right where you're at. Because, you know, they, because they know they're going to lose something of their own, you know, that, you know, that they won't look as successful if suddenly somebody who comes in totally green, you know, takes over for you. Lots right. of everybody nodding on that one. Go ahead, April. Sorry. And like, Mar <laughs> and like Frank was saying earlier now, I mean, this is at a particular position, right? But um, recommending new uh, capabilities uh, to your organization is also a way of moving up, right? Like, you know, this is how you could, you know, like recommending, let's say a data lake, if your organization didn't have a data lake or, um, or, or a data governance capability or, you know, the kinds of things, you know, maybe that your organization doesn't have is a way for you to, to, to move up, to, to create a new capability within the organization. I mean, not everybody at every level is going to be able to do that. Very nice. Uh, Darren. Yeah, uh, agree with what everybody's been saying. Uh, I, I do think that uh, soft skills uh, and, and focusing on, uh, you know, some of the relationship building, the trust. I mean, we, we talked about this as, uh, as, as we talked uh, about what makes us personally, uh, you know, good at our jobs and, and why we like being in it. Uh, the, the fact that we can get that trust and, and build relationships with people uh, is uh, something that, you know, if, if you're not very good at it, like there, there's opportunities to get better. I would say volunteer uh, as a mentor, volunteer, you know, at your local DAMA chapter to, you know, e either be on the board or, or present or, you know, uh, be a speaker, uh, you know, at, at uh, events like these uh, and, and just take the opportunities uh, that are out there so that uh, you can then further your skills and, and your opportunities, uh, build your brand and, and your reputation. Uh, because if you do come with you know, a, a new data lake or, or this new idea, uh, do they trust that you can take that and run with it and, and allocate resources to you uh, for you know, those more senior level uh, roles? and have that trust that you're going to be successful at it and, uh, you know, be able to, to move that. So uh, that's what I've seen. Very nice. David, anything you want to add? 
Yeah, so in, in general, I, I do tend to agree. I find it a little amusing that, that Frank said that technology is not the answer. And this from the guy who looks like he's got a Kodak Brownie and an old slide projector on the wall behind him. Um, I, I've got those too, Frank. Um, but very definitely. And, and just recently, um, you know, there are all of these tools kind of lying around. Big companies tend to, um, in one way or another, uh, grab them up and either maybe never use them or only use 10% of what they're capable of. And you can, you know, we have a mechanism where I can request having that tool installed and then start playing with it and discover all kinds of, of things uh, that it does. And, and actually one of those tools turned out to be a decent interim solution um, for some data quality issues until we could get something bigger and enterprise uh, strength in place. Um, the uh, definitely um, uh, keeping your, you know, training up your team. One of the things I really focus on is training the team that works for me how to do what I do. Now, they may not all be able to do everything I do, but if the combination of those things, of the people on the team have those skills, I can do things like, oh, go on vacation and not come back to 600 emails and crises because they've dealt with it while I was gone. Okay. Um, that said, uh, you know, when I look at what my boss does and the things that interest me, I try to learn how and what, uh, not that I really want his job because it's like a lot of administrivia, <laughs> but, and he does it very well. I don't want to do it. Um, but in general, uh, looking for new capabilities, looking to expand your education. And, I, you know, I come back to the webinars, uh, a lot of the data diversity stuff, um, the, uh, the conferences. I mean, I go to conferences looking specifically for uh, sessions that fill in the gaps I know I have. And by the way, you have to be able to admit to yourself that you have those gaps, that you don't understand that. And then look for those things to help you get educated, maybe go out and, and buy the book that that presenter has written on the topic um, and find time to read it. Because if you really want to expand and potentially either move up or sideways, um, you, you need to expand your, your knowledge base. I can add one one thing too, Shan. So I, as part of being with the bank, I was part of a bank that was acquired. I was in, on the acquired side three times. And mm -hmm. as far as survival there, what I found, and I, and I wasn't saying that technology isn't important, David, but but you don't want to connect yourself too closely to a particular technology. Like people that I saw that basically said, I'm all about this application. If it wasn't a selected application when they started doing migrations, they went with the application. They got yeah. tossed too. So you don't want to connect too closely and say, right. like, you pick those, I go, because that may be exactly what happens. Well, and you know, Frank, you, you remind me also about tool vendors, right? A lot of people sort of look at tool vendors as kind of a necessary evil. I look at them as a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. So if someone is selling an application or licensing an application, that does something that I don't understand. I don't understand what it does. I don't understand why it does it. Um, or I don't understand how it does it. I will ask the vendors to help me learn. Mm -hmm. If you make the vendor your friend, then they will be there for you to help you expand your education. And as a practitioner, again, looking for practical um, solutions, uh, sometimes just figuring out what the tool is doing as it does it, saying, oh, so that's how they solve that problem with their tool. Mm -hmm. Might not be the only way, probably isn't, but at least it's one way that, you know, a company has invested significant resources in bringing to the user community. Very nice. So let's shift the perspective a little bit. We've talked about how you all have 
grown in your careers, how you have um, stayed relevant yourselves. But let's talk about recruiting. So how do you recruit people and bring them into the data management space? What do you all look for? There's a lot of questions in the chat about certification. Should I get a certification? That kind of thing. Um, and where will the next generation of data management professionals come from? Um, uh, so let's, David, let's start back with you again. Okay. So, you know, in that vein, I actually made a note. I want to come back to something that, that Darren said, which is find the people who are interested and encourage them and train those people within your organization and even mentor people outside your organization and kind of keep them on your, here's an old fashioned term, your Rolodex, right? Your, your list. And as things come up and you have a need, you might reach out to them and say, hey, I have this um, position that I'm recruiting for. Um, and based on our conversations previously, uh, I think this, this might be right up your alley. And, and you know, you can do that, you can go at it that way. Um, being on the data stewardship side of data governance and therefore interacting, um, uh, interacting a lot with business analysts of one type or another, data analysts, you find the people who are really good at this stuff and who are really, really passionate about data and who want to protect their data and who want people to use their data properly. And as part of maybe being data stewards, they may develop the skills and including you know, the, the current tools like your business glossary or your repository um, that you could recruit them onto your team, right? And, and bring them in. So it's both internal, those people you're working with as well as external, the people you're mentoring. And that of course focuses again on the value, the two way value of mentoring, right? You're helping some young person um, perhaps uh, learn this stuff, but that person may also become a resource to you in the future. Very nice. And Darren? Yeah, uh, so I've done a, a, a number of uh, recruiting, building of teams, etc., and completely agree with what David is saying. Uh, because, yeah, I do rely on my network. For example, my current team, half of them are from people that I've met at DJIQ or, <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're already in my network, uh, et cetera. Um, one, one thing, you know, focused on uh, kind of, uh, you know, backgrounds and, and uh, educational uh, backgrounds, for example, uh, you know, there's not too many data governance majors or, <laughs> or programs uh, that are out there that, you know, people just linearly, you know, graduate from and, and come right in. And, and so generally, I, I look for somebody who has, again, in data governance, you know, tried to, I can see that they're already bridging that gap of, you know, they have a little bit of business, a little bit of tech, a little bit of uh, information systems, mathematics, you know, etc. And, you know, I'll, I'll usually see, you know, a couple majors or, you know, minors or uh, at, at least like a certification or, or an interest in, uh, you know, each of those. Uh, but I also wouldn't restrict it to just that uh, because, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, great data management professionals come from zoology, uh, from chemistry, from, uh, you know, all over. And so, I think when you're creating like a job description, for example, don't restrict it to, hey, you need to have, you know, such and such, you know, years of experience in data governance, for example, because it's relatively new. And so what, what are you really looking for? You're, you're actually looking for somebody who has that passion for data, who is showing that initiative to uh, and, and to touch on certifications, uh, you know, your CDMP. Uh, certification as a data management professional. That's uh, one of the big ones that I look for that shoots people up uh, my list if, if they've already shown that interest and, and have gotten that uh, certification. Uh, but there's others out there I've, I've mentioned before with particular tools, you know, that free resources, et cetera. Um, showing that initiative, you know, really shows me that they're, 
not in it just to, you know, get a paycheck every week. It's, it's like, no, you, you want to, you know, be more ambitious and uh, take on the challenge that is data management, uh, because you do have to be really passionate about it and, and be willing to accept the challenge. Very great. Very, very interesting. Passion is seems to be the common theme here so far, um, which I love. April, when you so the the um, when when I'm trying to build data people, right, or or discover data people who didn't know they were data people, um, a lot of times business analysts. Uh, have the skill sets that or, or a lot of the skill sets that you're looking for. So that can be a good fit, right? The detail oriented, you know, usually no SQL, right? Working with data. Um, so, so business analysts on the business side, you know, finding those people that are currently working with the data. It's, it's funny. I, um, I started teaching um, uh, prepping people for CDMP and organizations that I was working for. And more than like, it, it was about 50, 50 people who are not in it and people who are in it or interest who, who consider themselves to be data professionals. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, that, that, so kind of going around and sort of seeing what people are doing not that that's currently their titles or whatever, but the, but but you know what are they good at? And with technologists, like what I try to teach to the the people who work for me, right? And they quickly learn this is what I'm looking for. When we're when we're trying to do something, the first thing is let's look at the data. Let's actually look at the data. Let's not assume that it looks like this. Let's actually look at the data. And I and I find that, you know, when when I can get the programmers to be looking like that, to to look at the data, and and then they themselves know to look at the data um, without me prompting them to do it. And when they become converts, let's say, to that approach, um, a lot of times they become very interested in a data management, um, you know, jobs and experience and moving in that direction. And, and, um, and, you know, a lot of technologists, like they have no interest in looking at the data. It's like, look, I'm going to program this and, you know, leave me alone. Right. So it's like, yeah, clearly you're not, you're not moving in that direction, but, um, but uh, yeah, so that's the way I, I've been sort of, recruiting, trying to find those data people or or build those data people. Very nice. There's a comment in the chat there, you know, so true. And to actually look at data as a conversation, which is so important. Frank. Well, I guess with the more holistic IT experience I've had, I, I consider every role I've ever been in, every role I've seen as a data management role. I mean, they're managing data to some degree. Right. I mean, you're either creating the, the governance rules, right, or you're executing the rules and the execution of rules typically is done in an application. So those, those are your application developers, your DBAs, you know, putting, in, you know, the, you know, configuring the database in a certain way and then adjudicating the, the violations to the rules, which are typically done by IT auditors. So, you know, basically it's, a, you know, looking at it from that perspective, you know, who isn't in a data management role now, you know, what we consider more traditional you know, roles as data architect and, you know, MDM and, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, that kind of, you know, focuses on specific aspects of, of that. But, you know, uh, I, I think anybody in an IT role, if, if they really start to think about what they do for, you know, they, they realize they're managing data and, uh, and they're part of the whole, you know, equation. I actually wrote a presentation for my last organization called why everybody's job is data management yeah. pointing out what you know sales and marketing oh my gosh you know they're totally about the data right research totally about the data um you know operations well totally about the data finance totally about the data yeah. right so everybody's doing data management but 
you do find a lot of technologists who just really aren't interested in it. Um, they really just want to, they just want to code. Yeah. yeah, I guess and, some of us remember the days when we called it data processing. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the, when, the, when the technologists don't want to do that, it's very disappointing because what I've discovered is they can be your most effective gatekeepers. When, the, when they're understanding the data and looking at the data and something is wrong, they're probably the last place you're ever going to get told about it before somebody starts trying to use that data in a, in a way it's not going to work. Well, we, as we know, right, the earlier in the life cycle you discover a problem, right, the, the, the less hard and cheaper it is to solve it. And when the, you know, when the programmers are saying, hey, this data does not match the requirements you gave us, right, or, you know, you can sa just save a whole lot of time and, and cost and effort. Well, this has been such a great conversation, everybody. I can't believe we're out of time, but we are out of time. So <laughs> thank you all so much for being part of the panel. And thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest podcasts and the latest in data management education. In fact, you can go hear Darren's full podcast solo interview already. You may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational articles, blogs, and webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm -hmm.